five. Four. Three. Two. One. <laughs> Tiff, you're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. Hello and welcome to the very last motor show of the millennium. Today we'll be looking at what the manufacturers are going to do to keep us entertained as we motor bravely into the 21st century, but we'll also be keeping an eye on their prices and a nose on their emissions. Coming up on the show, we've got eight world firsts and 30 new faces to the UK, including two rather tweedy traditional rovers, Britain's first hybrid car and an electric sparrow. Quite. There's also plenty of glamour in the shape of sexy sports cars, Bentley's new plush red label and James Bond's latest acquisition, the BMW Z8. And later on, comedian Jenny A. Clare takes a look at motor show fashion while Leslie Phillips says a big hello to some of the classic cars on sale here. Hello. Let's kick off with the home team. Rover are debuting their new 25 and 45, which are facelifts of the old 200 and 400 models. On sale from next month, the new 25 has revised suspension, 15,000 mile service intervals, a three year warranty, and a smart new Rover 75 type schnozzer. But the best news of all is that we reckon this car will be at least 1,000 pounds less than the old 200. The 45 will also get a price reduction, plus it'll be more refined, more luxurious and more sporting. But its trump card will be Rover's very good V6 and five-speed automatic gearbox out of the 75 on sale from January. And from one large British institution to a rather smaller one. Caterham have been developing a top secret new model that they will also be unveiling here at the show. We were the first British TV crew to get to see this hush-hush design. And I went to a high-security MOD establishment to try it out. Last year, British rival Westfield produced their featherweight FW400, which raced to 60 in just 3.6 seconds, nearly half a second quicker than Caterham's Superlight R. So this year, it's Caterham's turn to up the ante. still isn't as light as the carbon fibre Westfield, but what Caterham have done is to squeeze an extra 40 horsepower out of the Rover power plant to give the 500 a power to weight ratio of 500 bhp per tonne, which means it can launch itself from 0 to 60 in just 3.4 seconds. <laughs> acceleration. It means nimble and responsive handling. <laughs> From the 
outside, it looks little different to any other 7, continuing the windscreen-free super-light tradition, but adding lighter magnesium alloy rims, body-hugging racing seats, and a carbon fibre dashboard with a rev counter red-lined at 9,200 RPM. The 7 has come a long way since its birth 40 years ago. With a price tag of £32,500, or just under 30 if you build it yourself, you don't get many creature comforts for your money. Then that's not what this car is all about. This car is all about performance. And it's perhaps a small price to pay for a car that will out-accelerate anything else on the road, apart from a million-dollar McLaren F1. But now for something cheaper and a tad more sensible, a Vauxhall. Very safe, very responsible, you think. But now they've gone completely mad and given us this, the VX220. It looks fantastic, nothing like a Vauxhall at all, thankfully. And because it's built by Lotus and based on an Elise chassis, it promises to be a pretty sensational handler too. Inside, it's gorgeously minimal, though Vauxhall says it will have more creature comforts than the Spartan Elise. The VX220 is powered by a new 2.2-litre engine, which means that it promises to lock horns with the Porsche Boxster in doing a 0-60 time of six seconds before romping on to 137 miles an hour. But it will cost a lot less, at about £23,000. It's on sale next summer, and if it goes as well as it looks, it should be a bit of a bargain. Citroen are predicting a brave new world with their C6, or Lineage. Now, at the moment, this is just a concept car, but don't be surprised if future Citroens look this good. They're also saying they're going to make a return to innovative technology. So cars like this could, for instance, have things like cameras instead of mirrors, an anti-drowsiness device that jabs you awake if you fall asleep at the wheel, and voice-activated controls. But best of all, they say they could make a satellite navigation system that doesn't require the mandatory one and a half hours worth of faffing and always takes you to Croydon. With this, you just get in and say, take me to 27A Redcliffe Gardens, and you'd be there without pressing a single button. All I can say is, roll on. Hello, my name is Jenny Eclair and I'm here at the Motor Show. I thought, you know, I was going to be very lucky and get to do handbrake turns in Aston Martin, but no, we're here looking at fashion and uh, they're giving me a job on the Say It stand and I've been fitted out with this lovely outfit here and to be quite honest, I'm not very happy. And it's very difficult to smile when you're sulking. This doesn't suit me. It's actually too short for a woman my age. My knees have gone. I feel like Dick Emery. It's all right for the girls because they're much younger. So girls, how do you think I look really? Great. Gorgeous. No, I'm not totally convinced. No, I mean, I think these are great outfits. Say if you wanted to be an air hostess, but you were very frightened of flying, this is quite a good look. But what I'm in search of here at the Motor Show is old-fashioned glamour. I think you look lovely, but I'm going to find some proper old-fashioned glamour. Come with me, lads. Ooh, what have you come out, girls? This is very dawn of the new millennium, isn't it? Uh -huh. Do you like it? I do. How would you describe this? Well, it's definitely original. It's very original. That is an understatement. It's, I'd call it an asymmetrical half tabard. And what do people say when, you, when they see you wearing this? Normally things like, can't we know afford the other half? And what do you say back to them? They know we've just been given the cold shoulder. Oh, well <laughs> You've got a little bit of a sexy detail on we the knee here. You've yes, got the sexy slit. slit to the side. So if you ladder your tights, you can close the zip. No, you have to uh, get a new pair of tights. Get a new pair of tights. <laughs> I do think you look fantastic, but uh, man-made fibres and I don't, I can't do it. So I'm sorry, but the quest continues. <laughs> have a girl. Continuing our Gallic theme, Renault have always been very good at predicting market segments that didn't exist. They did it with the Scenic and they did it with the Espace and they're doing it again with the Renault Avant Time. Now, what is the Renault Avant Time? Well, here it is before you. And it is, quite obviously, a cross between a people carrier, a two-door coupe and a luxury limousine. It's going to cost between 25 and 30,000 pounds in a Renault showroom near you next October. It'll have a six-speed gearbox, three to V6 engine, an aluminium roof, the biggest sunroof in the world, and doors that are five foot long. And check out those ample leather armchairs. But who's going to buy it? Well, nobody's sure, least of all Renault. 
but I reckon it's going to make the perfect vehicle for French politicians to visit their mistresses in. While Renault are busy with their Aventine, also waving the MPV flag is Mazda with their new Mazda, wait for it, MPV, a name about as creative and interesting as the car itself. The MPV joins the smaller Premacy and the even smaller Demio to complete the Mazda MPV range. Suzuki keeps the ball rolling with its Wagon R. It is a market leader in Japan, but we're now introduced to the Wagon RR, a so-called high-performance version with as much street cred as a shopping trolley, proof that Suzuki doesn't know its R's from its elbows. Renault also hoped to achieve something a little different with a four-wheel drive version of their Scenic, the RX4. It isn't guaranteed to get you through the toughest terrain, but it should help cope with snowy roads or dirt tracks. We're not done yet. This is the Verso, the first of a new breed of super mini MPVs. Based on the cute Toyota Yaris, there's a huge amount of space inside for a car so small, thanks to a high roof and fold flat seats. The Verso may well spawn a host of imitators when it goes on sale in January. And already making its mark in Europe is the futuristic MPV offering from Fiat. Kate's been giving it the once over. This is truly the most bizarre thing I have ever seen. A car that looks like it was made on Mars. It's Fiat's entry into the medium-sized people mover market, the Multipla, and it will take on the Vauxhall Safira and the Renault Scenic, but it doesn't have seven seats or five, but six. And the sixth person sits here in this seat in the middle, which is set slightly further back from the other two, so there's plenty of legroom, plus you don't feel like you're sitting in a line at a bus shelter. Now, broader members of the family are well accommodated because this car is actually wider than its rivals, although it's 14 centimetres shorter than the Scenic. And if you haven't got a full car, then you can fold this down to double as an armrest and a picnic table big enough for a feast. Brilliant. But the interior ingenuity doesn't end there because there's lots of clever storage space. This one is my particular favourite because it's exactly the right shape for a bar of chocolate. Now, onto the dash. There's a big clear speedo offset from the middle and the gear lever here pokes out by the radio so you don't elbow your passenger in the groin. This extraordinary beehive looking thing is actually air vents for your passenger. It's not particularly beautiful, but then if aesthetics is your thing, you probably aren't going to buy this car anyway. With these Flash Gordon looks, you might expect the Multipla to run on lithium crystals or something. Sadly, it doesn't. There's a choice of a 1.6-litre petrol engine or this 1.9 diesel, which is as quiet and smooth as these things get. All in all, the Multipla is a fairly decent drive. Whereas most people carriers like to perch you high up as if you're driving a van, this one is actually comfortably conventional, until of course you look at the dash and then you could be driving a spaceship. So in this case it really does seem that weird works. The multiple has got loads of room front and back, endless seat permutations and it's a very decent drive. Also, Fiat say it's going to compete with the Renault Scenic on price and that starts at just over £13,000, cheaper than the Safira. And really, unless you want the extra seat, I wouldn't bother with the Vauxhall at all. The Renault's the tougher cookie, but unless the Fiat's bonkers design turns your stomach, then I think this Italian car has the edge, which all in all means the Fiat Multipla is possibly the best people carrier yet. Strange, but true. Still to come on the show, Kate and Vicky will be agreeing to disagree on the latest Bondmobile, and Quentin gets classy with the Bentley red label. Who'd have thought the Modi show would be such fun? Hmm? Now, as anybody on the cutting edge of fashion will know, that this season, the cowboy hat is the thing to wear on your head, especially if you're a supermodel or a pop star's girlfriend, you know. And here at the BMW stand, we've got a variation on the theme of the cowboy hat. Not a cowboy hat itself, but quite equestrian in style. It's a bit like Ascot all of a sudden here, isn't it? Now, I think these are very smart. What are they trying to say about BMW? It basically represents BMW brand value, class and style. Class, sophistication, yeah. very, and if, of course, if you something horribly wrong with your hair, you can hide it underneath the hat. Yeah, yeah. I Absolutely. would like to try with this class and sophistication for myself. May I borrow a hat? Yes, of course. No dandruff, very no. clean, thank you very much. <laughs> of course, I've got a stupid hairdo and I can't quite manage it. 
And I do think they are classy. I think they're very sophisticated, but I'm actually looking for some good old-fashioned glamour. So I'm going to leave the class and sophistication now and go trotting around trying to find some glam, flesh. Not much flesh here, but the girls on the pro town stand are wearing something a bit more unusual. What's this look based on? Um, this is exactly what the racing drivers wear. Oh, I see, on. I yeah. see. And do you feel comfortable in it? Yes, very, very comfortable. Now, what I like about this, of course, is that you have got uh, little booties here. Yeah. That... And at the end of the day, your feet still sort of not bleeding. No, they're extremely comfortable. You will be the only girls leading the motor show without, without like being that. crippled. Yeah. And, and now I do think you look gorgeous, both of you. But I am going to disqualify you from my quest for glamour because flat shoes don't count. <laughs> the Volkswagen Polo has always been the sensible person's sensible car. Solid, dependable, well-made, but it's always been a bit safe. It's never really set the world on fire. But it might do now. Say hello to the new Polo GTR. Ah! Let's face it, Volkswagen pretty much gave birth to the GTI badge with the Golf. And this Polo, on paper at least, tries to capture that hot hatch spirit. It has the 1.6-litre 16-valve engine from the Golf, and with 125 brake horsepower, it reaches 60 miles an hour in a reasonable eight and a half seconds before going on to 125 miles an hour. This GTI has an improved suspension, which gives a more comfortable ride and better handling. Though this little minx has the added benefit of Volkswagen's electronic stability program, which works with the traction control to maintain high levels of corner and grip. A saucy set of 15-inch BBS alloys help identify the GTI from the rest of the range, along with a big honeycomb grille, larger front lights and body enhancements. Ahead of the driver is this lively-looking dash, which has been borrowed from Polo's baby brother, the Lupo. But in this VW, there are some tarted-up shiny trimmings and chrome dial surrounds. A range of models, including a new 75 BHP turbo diesel, could help the Polo lose its second car in the family status. The Polo has shed another skin, then, and has emerged as the most grown-up of all super minis. It's more comfortable, more refined and has more equipment, but prices are expected to be at the top end of the market. I love the way the Polo looks, but its performance isn't quite in the true GTI vein. It's a good car, but it'll cost you a mint. One of the most interesting cars at the show is Toyota's great-looking new MR2, which is a bit of a baby boxster. It's smaller, lighter and cheaper than the outgoing model and now goes head-to-head -head with the Mazda MX-5 and the Rover MGF. And, like the Rover, it's got a mid-mounted 1.8-litre engine that propels it from 0 to 60 in 7.9 seconds with a top speed of around 130 miles an hour. On sale next spring, price around £18,000. Wandering among all this burnished metal and sculptured steel, it's easy to forget that in this country we still don't get the cars, the quality or the service we deserve, which is why it might be an appropriate moment to talk about the Top Gear JD Power Car Customer Satisfaction Survey. This year we're looking for drivers of our edge cars, that's cars registered between August the 1st, 97 and July 31st, 98. And it doesn't matter if your car was a paragon of virtue or an utter chunk of junk, we still want to hear from you. So if you'd like a questionnaire and want to take part in the UK's best car customer satisfaction survey, simply dial this number. 0800 991 That's 0800 991 And don't worry, we'll repeat that number again at the end of the programme. And please, it is important because this way we'll hopefully one day get the cars and the dealers that we really deserve. Fiat has also played the revival game with the all-new Punto. It's a fair bit cheaper than the Polo, but almost as much fun as Quentin demonstrates. Yes, Vicky, you're right. For the money, it's a little bargain. Entry-level Punto started under eight grand, and even the screaming bonkers 1.8 HGT 16 valve is 13 and a half, which neatly undercuts the Polo GTI by a thousand quid. And the first impression you get is it is much, much smoother than the old model. It's not raucous when roused. It really feels quite 
quite refined, not in the same league as maybe a Renault Clio or a Peugeot 206, but not bad at all. And it has this fantastically clever dual drive power steering. What you do is you press a little button on the dashboard here, marked City, and it lightens up for town-bound work. And if you're on the twisty bits, you press it again, and it gives you more resistance. And how much Latin spirit is there under that bonnet? There's a 1.28 valve, a 1.216 valve, a 1.816 valve, and a couple of diesels. They're fizzy, fun, plus if you go for the speed gear automatic box, you get sequential changes, just like a baby Ferrari. Prices have yet to be announced, but we reckon the 1.216 valve should set you back around 10 grand and worth every penny. I can't believe it. I'm being nice about a Fiat. Whatever next. But what a nice little driver. It chats away animatedly to you through the pedal and the seats and the steering wheel. The ride is a bit fidgety, a bit restless on broken surfaces. Pedals too close together. And if you're going for the 1.2, make sure you get the 16 valve, not the 8. And that way there won't be any big black holes in your torque curve. But hey, it's a fine car. Good to drive, sensibly priced and really quite handsome and a lot more charismatic than a Fiesta or Polo. Hello, Jenny Eclair at the Most Show. Still in search of that elusive glamour thing. Now, I'm at the Vauxhall stand checking out what the girls are wearing. And if I was to be really horrid, I'd say it's a little bit corporate, a little bit 80s. But let's see what they think of them themselves. Now, who have we got by the front era? I've got Anna and Sarah. Hi, Hello, hi. nice to meet hi. you. Uh, Anna, can you talk me through your outfit? Please? Yep, we've got a neckerchief, mm -hmm. double-breasted lilac jacket, yeah. navy blue shift dress, yes. navy blue court shoes, and the lovely shimmering tights. Suits you. Now, <laughs> what do you think, Sarah? I mean, what do you think this says about Vauxhall, these outfits? I think it just says that we're friendly, unthreatening, and most of all professional, which is what Vauxhall want, definitely. Yeah, I think you're friendly. I'm, I'm not scared of you. And you. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, I mean, how do you feel glamorous in these outfits? Well... <laughs> I think we've got to answer. I'm going to go in and find something else. Thanks, girls. Oh, now, what have we here? This is more like it. Ladies, you look fantastic. I know this is sort of glamour in a postmodern, ironic kind of way, but how easy is it to sprawl on a car? Why don't you have a go? Why don't I? Indeed. Hoopla! Do you know, it's not that easy, is it? Do you have to clench with your buttocks? <laughs> you can't dig your nails in. No, you mustn't dig your nails in. Not on a £60,000 car. How do you feel in your frock? Really glamorous, actually. See, that's what we've been looking for. And now, finally, we've found it. You know, if I could just get a hold of one of those little black frocks, and I could do this, and then we'd all look like sisters. Wouldn't we? Not all people prefer their cars new and shiny. Some prefer them old and shiny, and on the second floor at Earl's Court is a plethora of classic cars. Tuesday has been designated as Classic Day. There'll be an auction of some of the fine motors of yesteryear, and providing you've got the readies, you can actually drive one away, which is more than you can do with any of the cars downstairs. Well... To help me gloat over this collection of classics, I need some help from someone who apparently knows how to handle them. Mr. Leslie Phillips, mm. how are you? Oh, I'm fine, Kate. Good. But I've just fallen in love. Have you? Yeah, oh, really? she's lovely, beautiful. Mm -hmm. The moment I saw her, I just thought, she's for me. She's a very lucky girl. Yeah, no, no, darling, no, not the girl, no, my car. My car, oh, come on. You men are all the same. Well, Kate, this is it. It really is so beautiful. Has it given you any troubles? Oh, <laughs> trouble is my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still going strong. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, it's a different colour. It's it? um, racing green, actually. Very British. Two-tone green. And was this something that all your friends had, sort of beautiful cars like this? Well, I remember That's one friend, um, darling Terry Thomas, had one just like this, actually. Oh, really? White. And he painted it psychedelic. He had little psychedelic flowers all over it. He was mad, really. <laughs> so you tempted to bid for any of these, do you think? Well, I don't know. You know, I had one like that. Did case. you? Long oh. time ago. It, it had more dirt on it. <laughs> 
So do you think we could ask you to give up your Mercedes and try a sporty little Italian number like this? Oh, well, I don't know. It's not quite my thing. Mm -hmm. no, no, I'm frightfully British. <laughs> Let's have a drink. Oh, that sounds like an even better idea. Yeah, or two. Better um, and better. You can get one of your chaps to run this old thing about, can't Why you? Why not, yes. Wendy. Very good plan. <laughs> and of all the cars to go under the hammer, none are surely more gorgeous than this sensuous Ferrari Daytona Spider, in which I'm sure Leslie would have pulled a great deal of totty in the late 60s and early 70s. Its 4.4-litre V12 power plant is a work of art itself, with six twin-choke Webbers that work in harmony <laughs> to bring music to my ears. 352 horsepower, 173 mile an hour top speed, with styling by Pininfarina, of course. Who could possibly resist the charms of a car like this? The Daytonas were so named after Ferrari's domination of the American 24-hour race in 1967. About 1,200 of the Daytonas were made and 50 of those were spiders. Yet only seven spiders were made in right-hand drive, which means that this Daytona should be something pretty special. But it isn't, because it's a converted coupe, which means that it's worth only 70 grand. Whatever the new owner pays, he's still going to have a fantastic experience driving this car around the roads. I don't care whether it's a conversion or not, it's still got the same V12 revving under that long, sensuous bonnet. And for wind in your hair motoring, I can't think of anything better to be in. Indeed, I could really sit back and enjoy this ride if I wasn't worried about how Kate was getting on with Leslie. Don't worry about me, Tiff, I'm doing just fine. Well, as well as Classic Day, on Wednesday and Thursday, there's Motorsport Special Days for the boy or girl racer in you. And at the end of the programme, we'll be giving you a full rundown of what's going on at the Motor Show here at Earl's Court. Yeah, they don't make them like this anymore, do they, Kate? No, they make them like this, the battery-powered Sparrow. Apparently terrifically popular in the People's Republic of California, Electric motors, charge it up for two hours, it will go for 60 miles, and it will cost you 1p for every mile. This one even has a CD player, and it is by far and away the most environmentally friendly motor here. But at £8,750, I think it's a rather expensive vision of the future. If we're talking green cars, our attention must turn to Honda, because the Insight is the first car to go on sale in the UK with a combined petrol engine and electric motor. In the showrooms next March, with a price tag of around £16,000, Honda claimed that, at over 80 miles to the gallon, the Insight has the world's best fuel consumption figures for a petrol engine car. And this car doesn't need plugging in. It's not slow either, because the Insight will leap from 0 to 60 in about 12 seconds, the same as a Ford Fiesta. The only drawback is there's no room in the rear for any seats because it's full of batteries. Audi have gone to war with Mercedes. This is the A2 going head to head with the A-Class. And like the A-Class, it aims to pack as many people into as small a space as possible by tucking the engine under the floorboards. But unlike the A-Class, this is made of aluminium, so it's light and super economical, giving you 83 miles to the gallon. And it's rather prettier, so you don't necessarily want to keep it in the garage, which is exactly where the A-Class belongs. The downside, it's £14,000, which seems rather a lot when you look at what Mr Wilson is driving for a mere ten times that amount. Indeed, £149,000 buys this, the new Bentley Anage Red Label. It's got a six and three quarter litre V8 and a turbo the size of a dustbin lid. All of which means that the new Arnage is as quick off the mark as President Clinton leaving an impeachment hearing. It will do 0 to 60 in 5.9 seconds, which, frankly, for something that weighs two and a half tons, isn't just fast, it's a miracle on the scale of loaves and fishes. Inside, it's like Chatsworth with the steering wheel. There's wood panelling, there's leather club armchairs. All you need is a few family portraits on the walls and a couple of chandeliers. But instead of having a butler to welcome you at the gates, 
There's this. As soon as you open the rear doors, the back seats electronically glide forward to give rear passengers ease of access, just in case the old gout's giving some jip. But with all this splendid tradition, there's also technology. You've got satellite navigation, traction control, and even parking by radar. Very Millennium, very Islington. Now, you might think that a motor car the size of Wales with an engine as big as Manchester would handle like a pair of white fronts in a tumble dryer, but you'd be wrong because the Arnage has speed-sensitive power steering and heavily tweaked suspension, so it goes round the twisty bits like a dodger. So, is it worth it? Well, if you can afford it, very probably. It is, after all, a Bentley, the most powerful saloon car in the world, still made by British craftsmen in a British factory, and nothing else makes you feel quite so special. But there is one small niggling problem. It's not the sort of car you can park outside just any old house. Nice pad back, Quentin, and you can see that stately pile on the new James Bond film when it's released in a few weeks' time, which brings us onto the man himself who shunned Aston Martin and opted for a Beamer, whereas this should be the classic English spy car. It is the beautiful DB7 Vantage Volante with a 6-litre V12 engine. It gets from 0 to 60 in just 5 seconds and it has a getaway speed of 165 miles an hour. In this latest film, Bond is driving a BMW Z8, but having driven this Aston Martin myself, all I can say is, James, what were you thinking of? I'll tell you what he was thinking. He was thinking that he'd be driving the better car. The BMW Z8 oozes style and sophistication from every air vent. It looks fantastic and has unbelievable power. The Z8 will be available in spring, but only in left-hand drive. And with the 50 destined for the UK already sold, you'll have to be a secret agent to get your hands on one. But if you do, it's well worth it. This car is sheer class. And finally, where do you get to see all this shiny new hardware for yourself? Well, the Motor Show is now on until October the 31st. It opens at 9.30am and runs until 7pm, except on the 26th, 27th and 28th, when it goes on until 9. Prices are £12 for adults and £7 for children, though it is cheaper if you book ahead. Now, ironically, this may be the Motor Show, but the organisers recommend that you travel by public transport. And don't forget the telephone number for our car satisfaction survey, 0800 991 And if all of you with our edge cars out there ring that number, we'll send you a questionnaire, you fill it out, send it back, and we'll get better cars and better service. The world will be a better place. Thank you and goodbye. Top Gear reviews the latest on the motor scene on Thursday night at 8.30 on BBC Two. Next this afternoon here on BBC One, the monsters of the oceans, walking with dinosaurs.